So this is our second lecture on the property known as exergy. We were introduced to it for the exergy is a new property for a closed system. There was a long equation for it, right? What was the equation? Something like E is equal to, the exergy is equal to U minus U naught. True? Then we had P naught, V minus V naught. Plus, sorry, that's a plus, yeah. Minus T naught, S minus S naught. And if you had any kinetic and you had any potential energy, you could lump it in there. But often our kinetic potential energy terms are negligible. Um, let's press forward. Can you, from memory, write the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system, not an open system, a closed system that undergoes a process from initial state 1 to final state 2? Can you, from memory, without the equation sheet, do that? In the interest of time, I'm going to strongly encourage you to be able to do that. You need to do that. But it's on our equation sheet. Yeah, but you don't have time on the equation sheet. And guess what? Everybody says about the exams. Not enough problems or not enough time? Which one is it? Professor, you need to put more problems on the exam? There's not enough problems? Or you need to give us more time? Which one is it? More time. Time wasted is looking at equations as such basic ones in the equation sheet. This is it. Does this look familiar? You could write it as delta E equal to Q1 to 2 minus W1 to 2. Why is there a minus sign in this W? Our assumed sign convention is work out of the control volume or system and in for the heat transfer. You could write it as... Uh, uh, delta U equal to Q12 minus W12. What, uh, what's the difference between this and this? You neglect changes in kinetic potential energy. It's just only internal energy change for the total energy change of the system. All right, we got the first law down. Have you used the first law of thermodynamics ad nauseum in thermal one? Yes. How about the second law? Can you write it down from memory? For a closed system, undergoing a process from initial state 1 to final state 2, what does it look like? I encourage you to do that. You need to be able to do it with confidence. No errors. Does this look familiar? So we have the change in the entropy is equal to the entropy could be transferred in with the heat. And if we're transferring it in with the heat, you can write it as integral of 1 over the boundary temperature, dq, coming in. If that boundary temperature is a constant, if Tb is a constant, it doesn't change. How can we change that integral? Doesn't that integral become something like the integral of del q? Hey, that's just q1 to 2 divided by Tb. True? Yeah. And then we would put delta S equal to Q, 1 to 2, divided by TB. All right. And then we had this other term out here, this plus what? Entropy can be generated. Can energy be generated? No. Can energy be destroyed? No. It can be transferred between forms. It may be transferred to a form that we don't care about and it kind of goes out of our mechanical energy balance equation. Sometimes you'll talk about conservation of mechanical energy, little friction. Well, some of the mechanical energy was transferred into some sort of you know, internal energy, heat. If something got hotter, that's wasted energy in some calculations. But energy is not destroyed or generated. But what about entropy? You can destroy it, yes or no? Can you destroy entropy? No. That would be a violation of the... Second law of thermodynamics. But you can have an increase in entropy. What are the source reasons or causes for the increase in entropy? Friction, irreversibilities. Friction's the number one, top of the list. Then you have mixing. Then you have heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. Then you have un unrestrained expansion or, or, pressure, or flow of uh, fluid through a, a big pressure difference or a significant pressure difference. Okay, so there it is, and you could put it just like that down here in this other equation. So where is work? Where is work? I can't spell work today, but where is work in the entropy balance equation? 
Man, that's a bad looking work. Try it again, Professor. W O R K. I can do it. Where is work in the entropy balance equation? And why is it not in the entropy balance equation? It's not there. Why is it not there? Isn't that associated with heat transfer, work transfer? Both of them are energy transfers. But why do we not have entropy transfer with work? We have entropy transfer with heat, but not with work, because work is an organized energy transfer. And loosely, we can interpret entropy as being a measure of the disorder of the system. All right. Can you write a similar balance equation for exergy? See the pattern? Energy, entropy, exergy. We call this the first law. We call this the second law. We do not call that the third law, but hey, it's just an exergy balance equation. Well, could the exergy go up or down? Could we have an increase in the exergy of the system? Sure. And we could have exergy transfer with heat transfer. I think the book uses the lowercase q. And we could have exergy transfer with work transfer. Exergy transfer with work. Yes, you can. And we'd put a minus sign on there just be, to like we put a minus sign on this one. Why? Because if work is out, then there's exergy transfer with that work in the same direction out of the system. All right. And then you could have... What do you think that term is? Why is the subscript D-E-S-T? Destruction. destruction. You can have the destruction of the ability to do work. That's called exergy destruction. Now, if you're doing a balance equation, should I put a plus or a minus sign in front of that exergy destruction? Down, it's going to destroy. Just think of that. Uh, let's say I had none of this, none of that, right? And then I had a process where the exergy was destroyed. So it's going to be a positive exergy destruction. Would the final amount of exergy, the potential to do work, be greater than the initial amount of exergy in the system? If I had exergy destruction, a lot of friction, no, it'd be less. So the sign works it out. I need a negative sign on that term. All right? All right. Uh, professor, can you flush this equation out some more, maybe derive it? Glad you asked. Here's the quick derivation for the expression for a closed system exergy balance. It's a combination of which laws? First or second law. That's how we got exergy as a property. So what do we do? We start with a first law focusing on the system. Here's our system. It's in communication with the local environment, and we're really interested in the work that can be useful that comes out of the system, not just the system pushing back the environment. That's not useful work. It's the work that actually comes out of the combination system and environment. Tricky concept, but that's the concept behind exergy. All right, so we write it, first law. So is the work that comes out of it expanding, is that part of the destroyed? <laughs> no, it's just not useful work. Okay. It's just not useful work. All right, but it's not necessarily destruction. OK, uh, let's do this. So we write the first law for the system only. So the system could have a change in internal kinetic potential energy in general equal to the amount of heat transfer into the system during the process. We could write it Q1 to 2, but we want to make it look like what we're going to do with the second law, combine it with the second law. When we write the second law, we have this integral 1 to 2 uh, del Q over TB. Okay, so that's why we write this there. It's the same. It's the same, see? All right. Minus the work 1 to 2, you could put a W there or just the work 1 to 2. Now, you write the second law for the system. Does it look correct? All right. Take the second law equation, multiply by T naught. What's T naught again? State Dead state temperature or environment temperature, typically 298 Kelvin, but you look in the problem statement, do they specify it or do I have to assume it? And then you take that equation, you multiply this whole equation by T naught, and then you subtract it from the first law equation. So you put a, must, a minus on it and add them together. So what will happen is you'll get the plus delta U, the plus kinetic delta plus the potential energy. And then what you'll have is you'll have the subtract of T naught times delta S. That'll come right there. See the negative sign? And then you'll have this term combined with that term. 
So what you'll have is the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 minus t naught over tb, all of that dq. Does that make sense? You combine this one and that one to get this one? Yeah. And then we had this work term. Now that work term is a combination of the useful work and pushing back the boundary. So let's go ahead and put it the useful work out of the combined system before we do WC, something like that. <laughs> minus p naught v2 minus v1. Isn't that the pushing back boundary work from the perspective of the system? Yeah, that's what it is. And then we had right here, we're going to have the subtract t naught times sigma ends right there. Pretty easy. This class is easy. I like this class. This is good. I'm keeping your attitude up. It's easy. So now we just move this term over to that side. And then we look and we say, you know what? This sure does look like a change in the property that we defined last time, the exergy. And then we look at this and say, if that's the change in the exergy, then this must be some way it transfers with the heat. And this must be some way that it transfers with the work, the shaft work coming out of the combined system. And this must be some way that it is destroyed. Destroyed, right? So that's the next slide, next page. So we have to see, oh, this is just our change in the property exergy. This is what we call exergy transfer with heat. This is our useful exergy transfer with work. And this is our exergy destruction. So there's our name calling. Notice that sometimes people will think because it's pushed back the environment, if, it, if the system pushes back the environment, that's a non-useful boundary work. So that's why it's not part of the useful work that comes out of the combined system. But there's our exergy balance equation. Pretty cool, huh? So there you go. We got the first law, second law, right? Look, you can't have notes like in your pocket, on your cell phone during exams, but I've never stopped anybody from having a tattoo. You want to tattoo your first or second? Okay, it's on the equation sheet. Don't tattoo it, right? It's not needed, right? These equations, we give you an equation sheet. But the change in the exergy, exergy transfer with heat, exergy transfer with useful work, and then we have the, um, the exergy destruction. Okay. Ready to solve a problem? Why not? Why not? A rigid, well-insulated tank. Make a sketch of a well-insulated, rigid tank. What does that look like? Yeah, just put something like this, put a little hash mark on it. Yeah, that's good enough. So we know that the Q during the process 1 to 2 is equal to 0. It contains so much steam, it starts at this pressure and this temperature. A paddle wheel. What? A paddle wheel comes in and stirs up the tank. True? Have you solved enough thermal one problems where there were paddle wheels? Yeah. All right. Until the steam reaches a pressure of one bar. What happens to the pressure? Does it go up or down? It was up. So think about it. I go in and I turn, I paddle wheel that steam. Do you think conceptually that makes sense that the pressure is going to go up? What about the temperature? Get colder, stay the same, go up. The students that first study thermodynamics say, hey, it's well insulated, right? Isn't it well insulated? When I transfer heat into the system, it would heat it up. Wouldn't it heat it up if I transfer heat into the system? Yeah, yeah. There's no heat transfer. It's got to be isothermal. Got to be the same temperature. True? No, 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 no. You have mastered that concept already. It can heat up. The temperature can get a lot hotter just because you paddled it. So there was a work transfer, an energy transfer into the system, not a heat transfer, and it made it get hot. True? All right. Now, <clears throat> ignore the effects of motion and gravity. Determine the final temperature, and then we'll get to the work transfer, etc. But let's go a step at a time. Here's the dead state temperature, 20C. The dead state pressure for the environment, 100 kilopascal. And here are the numeric values to the answers for part A, B, C, D, etc. 
So how do I solve this problem? Because we will, it's been a while since you took Thermo 1, you know, a couple days, weeks, right? You want to be organized. And I recommend you make a list of properties from initial state 1 to final state 2. And what properties would be of interest? Why not just make the general list of properties? Let's do the property of pressure, temperature, internal energy, or specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy. You could have other properties. The property of mass is a good one, too. All right, let's do this. Let's think about the initial mass and the final mass in the system. What's our system? We have to clearly define it as what's being enclosed by that rigid tank. It's the steam that's enclosed in that rigid tank. How much mass is enclosed by that rigid tank? 6.43 kilograms. At the end of the process, has the mass changed? That's a big observation. It's a closed system. Don't do an open system analysis of this problem. Closed system analysis, M1 is equal to M2. Has the big volume of the tank changed? They didn't tell us the big volume, did they? Did they say it's three cubic meters or so many liters or anything? No. But did the volume of the tank change? Why? Well, it's rigid. Now, how many times do you have to reread every word in a problem statement when you solve a thermodynamics problem? About five times, 12 times, I think I heard somebody say. You're right. If you're a great student, only five, right? So don't be ashamed, have to reread and say, how do we get that the volume is the same? It's a rigid tank. All right. Can you have a closed system where the volume does change? Closed system analysis where the volume does change? Piston cylinder, classic piston cylinder. Absolutely, you're very good. So now, help me a little bit. We are having our temperature one and the pressure one, 0.7 bar. This temperature one is 200 degrees C. The final pressure, P2, is one bar. We're asked to find T2. That's our first goal, get T2. What would be a good strategy to get T2? Okay. Yep. Somebody else, give me another way of just your own words. What's the strategy? Any other volunteers? I had two great volunteers. They're not saying they're incorrect, I'm saying they're good. I just want somebody else's words. Because you got to figure out during the exam what's my strategy? Or during homework, what am I going to do? What principles am I going to apply? You could do a first law of analysis. See, we always say, okay, just do a first law. Let's do a second law. I'm looking for something else. Use quality, PV diagrams. All those are good answers. I'm still looking for something. Uh, that's a great question. Because there's no heat transfer, will it be an isentropic process? Will S2 equal S1, yes or no? What do you think is happening with that paddle wheel when it's churning up the steam? Frictionless? Do you think that's friction? Yeah, no, 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 man. It's very irreversible. Very. No, no. It's not, it's, it's, it's heavy, heavy irreversibility. So uh, there's no way we'd have a paddle wheel beating up uh, the steam and it not, and it be reversible. It's just not going to work. It's kind of like, uh, let's, let's press on. The word I'm looking for is out of chapter one, state principle. State principle? Do this. What we do is we conclude that two independent intensive properties fix the state. Can you go and get V, U, H, and S for that system? Can you get the other intensive properties of interest for the steam at that temperature and pressure? And so what you do is you go and you find that it's superheated vapor. It's at 0.7 bar. What did we say the temperature? 200 degrees. 
There is V, there is U, there is H, there is S. I may not need them all, but all of them are available to me. How did that happen? I didn't use the first law of thermodynamics, basically exploiting the principle of the state principle. Two independent intensive properties, a simple compressible substance allows me to fix the state and get all the properties, intensive properties of interest. We do that all the time. You give me T and P, I'll go get U and H and V and S. That's what we do. Now that you use the state principle and you have a numeric value for this V and U and H and S, the next step is to exploit that it was a rigid tank. I haven't used the first law yet. And because V didn't change, what about the relationship between the specific volume at final state and the specific volume at the initial state? They're the same, and some students can struggle with this problem day and night and they not make that observation. But why is that a great observation? Because now, what do we know? To independent intensive properties, it fixes the state. may not be as lovely as our P and T, but we can work with it. So, in principle, can I get T2 knowing just P2 and V2? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I look at that pressure, one bar. I go and I say, go take a look. Maybe it's still superheated vapor. And I come down in this column of specific volumes, looking where maybe 3.108 is. And 3.108 is so close to 3.103 that during a rush of an exam, I would say close enough and just grab, here is... U2, here is H2, and there is S2. Where is T2? See that? You want to do the interpolation? I encourage you to do the interpolation, and you would find that this temperature is not precisely 400, but it's 40. Let me look at my notes, please. 401. Very good. 401. 0.2 degrees C. Box it, that's the answer for part A. Did we use the first law yet? Nah, but we did make heavy use of the state principle. And we exploited the information about how the specific volume is defined and what it means to be a rigid tank. Let's press forward. What's the work transfer? How would I find the work transfer? Now we're going to use the first law. And we're going to use it for a clearly defined system. There it is. So let's go ahead and write the first law. We'll say neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy, the, the mass of the system, which doesn't change, the final internal energy, initial internal energy, so it's a change in the energy of the system, is equal to, I'm going to put it in here because I'm going to strike it equal to zero, minus the W1 to 2. Is that a good first law? Now, why is that Q1 to 2 zero? Well-insulated tank. Yeah, that's right. And what are we asked to solve for? The work. So you can then just get the work, 1 to 2, is equal to minus the mass, U2 minus U1. We got the two U's from the table. You can do the interpolation just like we did for the temperature. And you'll pick up, uh, let me just give you the values, 1 to 2. I encourage you to fill in the details. But it's negative 2,000 kilojoules. Boom. Really, that's why this value was picked to be 6.43, kind of a unique number, is so that work would turn out to be a nice even number. 2,000. Why is it negative? Because it's actually into the system. The paddle wheel is a work transfer into the system, not out. All right. How about the change in the exergy? How do I find the change in the exergy? It's a property. Exergy is simply a property. Let's go back and review our definition of what that property was, right? And then let's go ahead and write it for what I'm asked to solve for, E2 minus E1, the change in the exergy. It's going to be the mass. When I do that, guess what? This becomes just U2 minus U1. Where did the U0 go? Well, the U0 with state 2 and the U0 with state 1 canceled. 
And then we're going to have plus P naught B2 minus V1. Where did the V naughts go? Canceled. And then we have minus T naught times S2 minus S1. S naught's canceled. And then we also have changes in kinetic potential energy, but because they already told us up here to neglect them, I'm not even going to write them and then throw them out. Now, there's three groups. So what I'm saying, what you say, and what I've repeated is that it's a property. Just calculate it as a property. Just, just calculate the change of that property in terms of other properties. Okay. Of these three terms, one of those groups of terms is zero. Either the delta U or the P naught delta V or the T naught delta S. Which of those groups of terms is zero? Because it's a, got it, it's a rigid tank. There you go. So these values you stick in. What about this T naught? It's 20 degrees plus 273, 293 Kelvin. And the S's, and you calculate that the change in the exergy comes right in at 969.5 kilojoules. That's the answer for part C. This is the answer for part B. What about part D? Yes, sir. So to get the correct values for um, the two entropies, you have to multiply that by the mass as well. Yeah, this mass right here, 6 point. Oh, oh that's right. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay, part D now. What is the exergy transfer with the work? What's the exergy transfer with the work? It's the same as the work. This is one of these easy questions. Sometimes I ask easy questions. Don't be surprised if it's an easy question. All right? Don't lose confidence. It's like, uh, really? It's, you told, I calculated the work is negative 2,000 kilojoules, meaning it's 2,000 kilojoules out of the system. What do you think the exergy transfer with the work is? Because it's one for one. All right, so this is the answer for part D. What about part E? What is the exergy destruction? How do I calculate it? Exergy balance. And so what we do is we say the change in the exergy is the Exergy transfer with the heat transfer coming in minus exergy transfer with the work going out minus exergy destruction. There was no heat. We just calculated this to be 969.5 kilojoules. This was a negative of a negative 2,000 kilojoules. And so you can calculate the exergy destruction. And you have to watch those negative negatives, the signs and all that negative signs can trip you up. But it will come out to a positive of around 1,030 kilojoules. Yes? There's not ever going to be a point where the exit you can't work isn't a one-to-one, -one, is there? Well, I have to be careful because back here, when we have this work, we only want the useful part of the work. And sometimes you may be pushing back the atmosphere, and you may have to subtract that off. So be careful about pushing back the atmosphere. That would, That's a like non... For a, rigid system. for a rigid system, you don't have to worry about it. Everybody good? Should the entropy destroyed always be positive? Okay. Can the entropy generation be negative? Can sigma ever... Let's go back here. Can this term ever be less than zero? No. Likewise, it would be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics if this term right here, which is the negative of a positive quantity times a positive quantity, right? Th th this is the exergy destruction. You have a minus sign on it. The exergy destruction always has to be positive. You cannot have an exergy destruction. Um, did I say that right? No. A negative, you cannot have a negative exergy destruction, which would be an exergy sort of production. Right? Yeah. So, yes. Um, back at the uh, question slide, I just keep saying, 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 I just keep
it's kind of hard to avoid that. Is that the gen magnitude? Yeah. So it's like a bank account. Somebody put in two thousand dollars. And then they said, uh, hey, how much money do I have in my checking account? I put in 2000 yesterday. And the bank tells you, you put in 900, you have $969 available for withdrawal. You'd be a little upset. They say, well, yeah, it's friction. <laughs> Irreversible. Hold it, I put in 2000 really good dollars. The maximum I can get out right now is around 970 Yes, that's, that's the story. Yes. What happened to the 1,030? Gobbled up. Somebody's profit. All right. Uh, try to put this all in perspective. We learned a lot in first law and second law and thermal, thermal one. Now we come over and we have some new properties associated with exergy. But thermal one dealt a lot with energy. And so for a closed system, what would be the key energy on a per unit mass basis? We did use lowercase e early on in Thermo 1. It's in our textbook. What was it for energy? What was the total energy? It was a combination of three components, potential kinetic and internal. See? That's not that hard. U, K, E, P, E. And so that was our energy. How about for exergy? Did we already have, hey, uh, exergy for a closed system, a property, a new property? Well, that was a much longer definition, wasn't it? Wasn't it U minus U naught, P naught times V minus V naught, minus T naught times T, blah, blah, blah. All of that. Look familiar? Yeah. So you had the same type of property equations. Well, how about this? When you go to an open system, you can have mass transfer in and out of the system. When we were doing energy analysis, they did not introduce a flow energy. They did not. They could have. But they had a new property. What was that new property for an open system, which was different than for a closed system, which had these three parts? Yeah, it multiplied m dot. Enthalpy. Remember that new property, enthalpy? And you said, what is this? What was H defined as? U plus PV. But they said, oh, this is H plus the kinetic plus the potential energy, right? But this is the same KE. That's, isn't that specific kinetic energy? Isn't this the same PE? Yeah, it's the same. So instead of, they did not do this. They did not introduce flow energy, but they could have but they did introduce the new term enthalpy. I'm trying to help you navigate the new information from the old information. Now, we come over here to exergy. There's a new exergy. It's a lot like enthalpy. It's given the symbol E sub F, very similar to E for exergy. I know the book uses a slightly like different italics or something font for exergy versus energy. But it's H minus H naught minus T naught S minus S naught plus kinetic potential. It looks like, hey, these are the same. That's the same. You know what? Even this is the same. Really, it's this combination to make that. That's what it is. And so it looks like, oh, yeah, when we have an open system, we just have uh, enthalpy. In the definition, now we use a flow exergy. So they do call this a flow exergy. They did not call any flow energy, but they could have. And this is our exergy, and that's our internal energy. Hopefully that helps. I know I get these questions all the time. I don't understand why do you use H sometime and U sometime? Why is this E or E sub F for exergy? Okay. So for a closed system, we want to compare it with a control volume, an open system. For a closed system, you undergo a process from initial state one to final state two. The exergy can go up or down. Here, we're not going to do 
anything but steady state calculations for an open system or control volume. So there is no rate of change of X or G in the control volume with respect to time. That's always zero, so just put zero right there. It's always zero. We only really in this whole class, Thermo 1 and Thermo 2, only solve a handful of real transient problems. And it's not in this chapter. Okay? So that makes life easy. Now we do have the possibility of exergy transfer with heat transfer. You could have multiple heat transfers. Great. You have that shaft work going in or out. So it's in out of the control volume. That transfers the exergy as well. It's a one-to-one -one right there. That's why it's just W dot itself. If you have only one inlet and one outlet, then there's really no need to sum over multiple inlets and outlets. And the mass flow rate in is equal to mass flow rate out at the steady state. Makes it even simpler. And then you have the flow exergy in, flow exergy out. And then you have this term, which is the exergy destruction rate. Did I, define, did I derive that equation? Not today. Do you think we can use it to solve a problem? Sure, let's do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'll get back to this later, but um, basically here's the cliff notes. Mass balance. Be able to do it for a closed system, do it for an open system. Energy balance. Do it for a closed system, do it for an open system. This is entropy balance. That's the second law. Do it for a closed system, do it for an open system. And this is now exergy balance for a closed system as well as an open system. What happens, sometimes students get discombobulated, we'll give them a clear problem, it's a closed system analysis, and they'll throw equations at it that are open system. And you, you, you got to be able to not do that, right? All right. Let's solve this problem. Steam, 3 kilograms per second at 80 bar and 440C, enter a well-insulated turbine. So maybe you make a little sketch. Oh, there's my turbine. We'll have some M dot coming in, maybe state one. And we have the temperature. The pressure at one is uh, 80 bar. And the temperature one at 440 degrees C. And then the steam comes out, state two. And the, I forgot to emphasize that the turbine is well insulated. So Q dot is equal to zero. And we'll have a W dot out of that turbine. Okay. And the mass flow rate is given m dot equal to 3 kilograms per second. Get rid of it right there. Okay. Okay, it exits at a pressure P2 of uh, 20 kilopascal. All right. The turbine isentropic efficiency is 85%. First question, determine the power out of the turbine. Can you do that from thermal one? Yes. With confidence before the first exam? Yes. All right, so what would you do? I'll just talk through it, okay? Or do you want me to ask you questions and lead you through it? Which way do you want to go? Professor, put on your monologue skit and just do it by yourself? As if nobody's in the room? Or try to engage us and walk me through? What's your preference? Okay, show a hand. Professor, monologue. You're up here at the podium. Act like it. All right? Put me through it so I can step through. All right, looks like that's the winner. So determine the power output of the turbine. I'm really asking you to calculate W dot T. Right there it is, isn't it? So, sorry about that. Isn't that it right there? How do we do it? Somebody help me. First law of thermodynamics is a great place to start where we clearly define the control volume that does what? Surrounds the turbine and we have one inlet. How many outlets? One outlet and it's steady state and there's no heat transfer. So you could start with the most generic first law of thermodynamics for a general control volume and then start striking those terms. And you should be able to do that. And you should be able to get it down to, after a little manipulation, the power out of the turbine is proportional to the rate of flow of steam through the turbine and neglecting changes in kinetic potential energy 
because they didn't give us any information about the change of kinetic potential energy. So I would assume, if it's not clearly stated, just say I'm going to assume that. It boils down to H1 minus H2. True? That's a familiar equation, but you may, at thermal one, you had to really struggle to get that from the more general equation. All right, so how do I get H1? State, state principle. State. I know two intensive in, independent properties of state one. Do you think I can get H1? 80 bar, 440C? Sure. Did I put it on this one? Ah. Uh, did I say 8 bar or 80 bar? Is that 80? All right. Did I miss something here? Put on my glasses. That is 80 bar. Good. Okay. I can't see it on my screen. Sorry. Um, so now we have 80 bar 440C. There is my H. I know that I, you know, it's it's V, U, H, and S. And there's S if I need it. Grab S right away. You have solved a lot of thermal problems. <laughs> How many times you then? Oh, I gotta go back to that table and grab that S. All right. So, so you get the H one. How about the H two? Maybe you wanna uh, make a little sketch of a favorite temperature entropy diagram. Put a line of uh, high pressure of 80 bar. Put a line of low pressure of 20 kilopascal. You're out here superheated. We don't know if you're going to come in here two phase or if you're going to come out here superheated. You have to figure that out. So what do you do? You get the S, right? So you get the, uh, um, um, here's H1, you get S1, right? And you get like two, here's state one, here's two isentropic and then you're going to kick it out over to the side because if there's irreversibilities, it's going to end up with higher entropy. S2 is going to be higher than actually S1, and it'll be kicked over. It could be kicked over and still in the two-phase region, or it could actually be challenging problem kicked out into the superheated regions. You have to calculate that. But somewhere there's going to be two actual and two S. For this problem, both of them are under the dome. All right. They're both under the dome. But the two actual has a higher quality. Okay, so what we do is we have our two values of H and S. There is our S value. We would then go to the table for saturated water. And I need to scroll down just a little bit. Okay, scroll a little. This uh, pressure right there, what pressure is that? Is, my, is that my 20 kilopascal? That's 20 kilopascal. We would look between S of F for saturated liquid and S of G at 20 kilopascal. Does this value fall in between? 6.519, sure does. And so we calculate the quality at 2S. And when you calculate the quality at 2S, I think it comes in at about 80%. What do I do now? I just did, but I haven't used isotropic efficiency of that turbine, have I? So basically I get the H2S is H of F plus the quality 2S times HFG. So I get my exit enthalpy, which would be if it was completely reversible, 2146.6 kilojoules per kilogram. Get the maximum work out, isentropic, H1 minus H2S. Notice a lowercase w on that. It's specific work out. We would find that if it would have been 100% reversible, it would be um, 1099.5 kilojoules per kilogram. True. But what is the actual work out of the turbine if the isentropic efficiency is 80 some percent, 85, I think, for this problem. So we're only going to get 934.6 or 934.5 kilojoules per kilogram. 
true. So what is my actual enthalpy out? Inlet enthalpy minus the, what the actually went out in the turbine. So the actual enthalpy out is 2311.6. It's higher than if it would have been isentropic. And you can calculate the quality at state 2 actual. H uh, 2 actual minus H of F divided by HFG. And you find the quality is 0 0.8736. So that's higher quality. It went from 80% to 87%. Very good. So now we can go back and we can say the power output of the turbine multiplied by the mass flow rate of three kilograms per second. And the actual power out of the turbine is 2804 uh, kilowatts. Part B. Looks like I'm running out of time, aren't I? All right, make sure, thank you. Somebody was packing up a little early. That's very distracting to me. Make sure that you stay with me. I know that you may be anxious to get out of here. You sit over near the edge so you can scoot. If you have an exam that follows this class, do me the courtesy and say, Professor, I'm really worried. You may go all the way to 950 or 150 or whatever it is, and I may not have enough time to get to there, and that'll help me, okay? Or I need to make it to a dentist appointment, doctor's appointment, something, sit up here in the corner. But one of the things that will really disturb me if people start shuffling to box up before I end. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time.